Hello. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Technology for Good uh, Hangout. It's episode six. The background today looks a little bit different, um, and the audio may sound a little different because today is Dia de Andalucía. It's the national holiday in Andalucía in the south of Spain, where I'm based. So I'm in my brother-in-law's place working off my laptop. So if anything screws up, it's all my fault. Uh, with me today, I have as a co-host, Mr. Chris Adams. Chris, say hey. Greetings, everyone. How are you doing? Of course, so how are you doing, Tom, actually? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. I, I was in, uh, and we'll, we'll be talking about this later, I was in uh, Las Vegas during this week at the IBM Pulse conference, so I have a couple of links about some of the stories I came across there. Uh, my legs swelled up like a balloon from all the travel because I've got a, got a, a bum ankle at the moment. I'm, I'm on crutches. Near the crutches. I'm on crutches for the last number of months because of my ankle. It was operated on in December, but you know it's a thing or nothing. It's getting better, so all all all's good is the bottom line. We have a load of stories this week, and a lot of them with a mobile theme because this week was the uh, Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. So a load of announcements came out from the mobile space this week. So less than normal about other topics, and more than normal about uh, mobile. But to start with, and I'll just share the screen here, the first thing I wanted to talk about was this report, as I share the screen, uh, the uh, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the US, wrote up its global analysis for 2013, that's last year. And it's, it's not particularly good news, so this is the bad news. We'll get that out of the way first, and then we'll go on to all the good news. The, the news, it, the, the highlights from last year, they talk about the fact that it ties with 2003 as the fourth warmest year globally since records began in 1880, with an uh, annual combined land and ocean surface temperature was 0.62 degrees above the 20th century average. And there's a load of other statistics there if you want to really depress yourself about where the climate is going. And this image in the center there, if you click on that and open it up, it shows like this. It's a picture the globe and it talks about all the significant climate anomalies and events for the year 2013 and this is a small version of the picture you can literally click you've got a little um, magnifying glass there you can click around and anywhere and you can see here in Spain the uh, in March Spain received more than triple its monthly average precipitation it was the wettest March since national records began in the UK it experienced its coldest March and May since 62 and 96, respectively, with overall the spring being the coldest in 62, and so on and so on. Jerusalem had snow, Ghana had temperatures of 43, you know, everything. Records being set all over the globe, and none of them particularly good ones. So, okay, that's the bad news out of the way. We'll go on to the, the better news. This week, as I mentioned, I was in Las Vegas for IBM's IBM Pulse conference. It's kind of its service management conference, although they're rebranding it as their uh, premier cloud conference. The image I have here is from a group called Les Hombres, who performed on stage for the opening. And I don't know if you can see there, but they're kind of acrobats, and there's three, they've, they've spelt out the three letters of IBM in that picture. That it, they also spelled out a, a load of other words at different times when they were performing. They put on a, a great show. And IBM made some significant announcements at the event. Um, one of them was that they bought this NoSQL cloud database startup called CloudAnt. Uh, and the other one that they talked about was their new IBM Service Engage site, which is that IBM uh, serviceengage.com. All the links for the show will be in the notes afterwards, so don't worry about trying to keep up with me on the links here. We, we'll post them in the show and we'll post them on the YouTube page as well afterwards. The reason I brought this one up, the Service Engage one, is it's, it's an interesting one. It seems to be a kind of a change in model by IBM, where IBM's bringing their enterprise software and giving it a more kind of a consumer look and feel. Uh, unusually, for a kind of an enterprise system, you can explore a live demo. Now, this, this service engaged site at the moment does performance management, service management, workload automation, Internet of Things, those kind of four areas, but they're going to be adding to that catalog. But like I say, you can explore a live demo using test data. You can go in and look around. You can also request a free trial, and then you can go ahead and purchase afterwards. It's, it's a big game changer, I think, what IBM is doing. 
here because they're, they're, it's very unusual for an enterprise software company like that to put up a site like this which allows live demos. This is more a kind of a startup look and feel than an enterprise. So it's great to see that's happening. IBM trying to become more agile. I know other companies like SAP have, have done this before, but when SAP tried to do it with their Afari one and I went in to try it out, uh, I was sent over to try and get in contact with an agent as opposed to actually getting into the live demo, whereas with this one you can actually go into the live demo. So it's, it's cool to see that kind of agility within an organization as large as IBM. And so, Go, go, Chris. Yeah, it's actually this is um this is actually really interesting coming from IBM because uh, um uh, there's um platforms as service uh well, kind of platform uh, called um, Cloud Foundry that IBM has recently invested in, and um, I was at an event yesterday that was um, run by Red Monk um, and uh, around this, and it looks like IBM with, with them, their recent project, cl uh, codename Bluemix, shows them moving to something like a very very much more kind of consumer focused approach so that you don't need to be kind of contacting your sales rep to try out some of this stuff and uh, to see IBM essentially taking on uh, almost feeling a bit like Heroku in times when uh, to, to actually try engage some of the services is it seems very very unlike IBM but it's really interesting to see such a behemoth do act, try and act something like a small startup actually I think um, we'll probably see more of this over the, over the year Absolutely, it's <clears throat> and I, you're, you're right to bring up uh, Bluemix. Bluemix is one of the other big announcements out of uh, the the IBM Pulse event, uh, and it's 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 interesting because, as you say, it's it's a development environment, uh, web based uh, with a lot of back end services built in. So again, for 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 developers, for for enterprise software people, uh, or even for startups, it's 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 massively interesting. So it's it's great to see how they're kind of pushing the envelope on this kind of stuff. You know what? They're, they're being challenged by the more nimble, smaller companies, and that they're having to respond to it. And kudos to them, they are responding. But it's great to see all these startups pushing them that way as well, because you know some of the some of the great startups out there are really, really doing some interesting stuff. And if you're a large enterprise player like an Oracle or an SAP or an IBM or any of these, you know you're really starting to feel the heat from underneath. So it's cool to see this kind of thing happening. Now back to the stories, and I got a find my screen share button. Bear with me while I switch over to, okay, so this story should be on screen any second now. Uh, open ID. So <clears throat> one, of the, one of the big issues uh, a lot of us have is, you know, maintaining our uh, usernames and our passwords across multiple sites. And one of the things that uh, that makes it easier to, to do that is to have a single ID which gets you into lots of different sites. Facebook does that, for example. You can log into lots of sites with Facebook, and that's pretty cool. Although I'm a little unsure about giving Facebook access to my, my data on other sites. Other ones, though, there's this uh, Open ID Foundation, and you know, there's been this Open ID thing around for quite a while, but it's always been kind of hard to implement. But they've launched a new version of their Open ID Connect, which is, and you can read the article, you can read, go down through it and read it afterwards. It's based on OAuth as an authentication system. Uh, the old version used to use XML, but the new version uses OAuth 2.0. And OAuth 2.0 is more SSL based than XML based, so it's a lot more secure. It's also apparently a lot more straightforward for developers to roll out. So it's going to be great to see companies uh, and developers signing up to this. There's a lot of companies that roll out this. Google, of course, are a big one. Uh, and the GSMA at the Mobile World Congress or Congress in Barcelona also announced a version of it called Mobile Connect, so it'll be great to see it happen on mobile sites as well as on main websites. So that's all excellent. And as I say, there's a big mobile theme here today. <clears throat> Another, the, we're also going to talk a bit about security because there was a lot of security stories that yeah, came up during the week as well, and this is the first of those. Well, it's the second of those if you count the last one, I suppose. <laughs> I was never good at counting. Uh, but this, this story from the BBC, talks about a massive trove of personal data which was found by security researchers for sale on black market websites. Now, it's not unusual for hackers to go and to download a lot of information on people from sites and then set, put that for sale on these black market websites. What's different about this one is the number of account credentials they uncovered. 
apparently they came across 360 million account credentials, including email addresses and passwords. And not alone that, but they also had one and a quarter billion email addresses without passwords, but email addresses. So, you know, 1.25 billion email addresses. If you're watching this show, it's highly likely your email address was one of those because, you know, 1.25 billion, you know, there aren't that many out there. <clears throat> well, there are that many out there, but, you know, there's, there's 1.25 is a big number compared to the amount of email addresses that are actually active. So, what can you do about it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure you can do anything about it really, except to say uh, you if, if you can expect more spam as a result of this. Uh, if you had a password that was included in this, and I'm not sure how you check that, but uh, if you had a reasonably straightforward password, you should change it immediately. You should not replicate passwords across sites. So individual passwords for for every different site. Um, I use a password management application called OneWord, which is awesome. Um, uh, but there are other uh, ones out there as well, which you could also use. Um, so I, I think it, it's it's been it's been it's been said that this is kind of a monster monster site uh, and, and, a, and a monster trove of of information. So. so uh, it, it, it's, it's worrisome to think that it's out there and I don't know, Chris, what do you, what do you want to say about this? Um, well, this is actually, this is really, really worrying actually. There's one thing that, and this isn't one of the, this isn't really the first time this like, information, you know, about, about us, ourselves gets, gets leaked out like this. Um, but one thing that you can do in addition to like following the, 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 the steps that Tom mentioned about using, you know, password managers and things like that, um, there's a website called Have I Been Pwned? Dot com, which um, basically lets you kind of see some of this stuff. If you see, um, I'll just share it with Tom so he can actually, so he can, he, he can share the link that um, I've had recommended to me before. And uh, yeah, I'll just add it to, to, this, um, to, to the list there, Tom. Basically, if when you hear about various data breaches, let's say you're using maybe Adobe, um, you, you've, you, you've heard about various breaches that have happened in the news, they basically, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll take a list of all this information and if, you're, if your email address appears, they'll say, well, yeah, you you were caught in this. You you should probably change your password as well because you're already compromised. That's one thing that you can actually do, and that's one. Uh, hopefully, will the people who actually report that's this great, can put it onto here, so that, you can that's see. That's a great point, Chris. That, that's a great point, Chris. And one one thing people should bear in mind is that while that is a good site to uh, to check out on, there are other sites that are not so good. So you want to be careful to be, to to use. Uh, um, Authenticated sites. If you want to check usernames and passwords, you really don't want to be pa typing your, your password in mm. to check it on a site that you don't trust. Uh, as I say, that that is a good one, so no worries about that. But be be careful on these kind of things, and do use do download and use a decent password management application. The sooner we get rid of passwords as as a way of authenticating ourselves, the better. And we might be moving towards that with you know biometrics and stuff. We'll we'll, we'll see how that plays out. There's a couple of stories in that vein that we'll be talking about in a minute as well. So back to sharing the screen. And the next story I came across, again on the kind of um, security one, was this one. This one's on the BBC website, and it talked about how energy firms, the utility companies, how their cyber defences, how their security, are too weak, according to insurance companies. And this came about because there's a, a number of insurance companies in the UK who've announced that they've seen a massive uptick in the amount of utility companies coming to them looking for insurance in the last year or so. And uh, this comes from uh, an underwriter at Kiln Syndicate, which offers cover via Lloyds of London. And Kiln Syndicate is one of the places that they insure things like container ships, oil tankers, large development projects, and things like that. And they've noticed a lot of utilities coming to them asking for insurance. And what they do when somebody wants insurance is they send out auditors to see, you know, what the security situation is like. And these, this company, Kiln Syndicate, is saying they're going, they're auditing these utility companies, and they're walking away and saying, no, no way, we're not insuring you, not until you get your security up to any kind of a decent level. And the reason this is happening 
Uh, I'm not sure why the utilities are, are, are suddenly getting so interested in in in, uh, in insurance around hacking. Uh, possibly it's because of the uptick and the amount of hacks that have been publicized in the last t two years. But the 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 reason insurance companies, or sorry, the reason the utility companies are being turned down is because they have a lot of legacy systems in place and they're putting a lot more connectivity in place. And when these legacy systems start being connected. These legacy systems can be using protocols like SCADA, which is an old protocol which doesn't have a lot of security built into it, or the earlier versions of it didn't. And you know, a lot of these uh, utilities are you know critical infrastructure. And what we haven't had a decent hack on a utility company yet. Um, it's only a matter of time if you think about this. It really is because their infrastructure is not secure and it's being connected to the web, and apparently there's a lot of uh, a lot of interest in this from the, uh, the, the the cracker world, and also you've got to think because it's critical infrastructure, the nation states who do this kind of thing. I've got to be interested in it as well. We saw a couple of years ago uh, there was a big malware attack on the uh, Iranian nuclear power plants. Um, they were shut down by a malware program which was written by, it's speculated, the US and the Israeli governments. Obviously the US and Israeli governments are not going to admit to doing it, but it was really, it was one of the first uh, examples of cyber warfare. And now we're seeing that um, all of the, or a, a significant number of the utility companies globally are insecure, so much so that they're being turned down for insurance. So this is really something they got to get their asses in gear on. And we'll, 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 we'll see if they you know, come up to the challenge. If they don't, some of them will be shut down, which won't be fun. So one thing that's probably uh, driving this is that when you have, I mean, I don't like really using the word of like, you know, the things like Stuxnet and other things which are generally you know, assumed or been described as cyber weapons. When you use yep. something like this on an adversary, you can't. You, you end up sharing the source code with it, so you cannot use a weapon without sharing it with them for it to be used with other people. So what, you know, you open Pandora's box, and because you're attacking something like SCADA with stuck with or SCADA systems, it doesn't just only single out you know SCADA systems in Iran. They can be then used against any other SCADA system. So this and is they, what. And 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 you're you're seeing that. I mean, the, the Stuxnet is the one I was talking about. Um, and what happened with that was when people, when the, when the security researchers dissected it, they found it was the most complex bit of malware they'd ever come across by orders of magnitude. But of course, as you say, the source code was made available. So they gave this source code to the Iranians, who now have that ability as well. And we've seen a lot more malware appear in the time since Stuxnet first appeared. A lot more malware has appeared, which have used some of the code from Stuxnet. So it's it's insane, as you say, you're handing them the keys to the kingdom. Okay. Uh, back to the sharing again. And the next story uh, that I came across was how Andro Android malware is using the Tor anonymity network. So for the first time, we've seen uh, before now the Tor network, which is a great network for if you want to stay anonymous. Uh, but it's also started to be used by people who are writing malware. And this week, for the first time, uh, Kaspersky Labs, who are doing great work spotting malware at the moment, have seen a load of information come out of them in the last couple of months. But they've, 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 they've previously found uh, Windows attacks, uh, which, which were held on, um, uh, on Tor and using, using Tor sites to uh, control uh, botnets for Windows, they've now seen it for the first time for Android. So again, it's some, something to be aware of. It's, it's not something we can do a huge amount about, but if you have an Android device, just be careful about links you click on. I think that's, that's as much as we can come up with on that one. Next up, uh, and again, there's, there's a lot, as I say, of, of mobile links today. Uh, a fingerprint scanner has, has come on the Samsung Galaxy S5. So the first phone with a decent, or the first phone, yeah, the first phone with a decent um, a fingerprint scanner was the Apple 5S. There was a couple of phones before that which had them, but they weren't great. So the first phone with a decent fingerprint scanner was the Apple uh, iPhone 5S. 
and hot on its heels comes this Galaxy S5 from Samsung. The difference between the, um, and this was announced at the Mobile World Congress in uh, Barcelona, to no great surprise, it had been well speculated, but the big difference between the fingerprint scanner on this device and the one on the 5S is that the uh, Apple made the decision to lock their fingerprint scanner down completely so that it's only used to access the device and for purchases, some purchases, through iTunes on the, on the device. So it's where Apple controls the entire chain end to end, whereas Samsung are taking a different approach. Samsung have got the fingerprint scanner, but they're also using it as a way of identifying someone's identity or, or uh, verifying someone's identity. So they're using it. They're allowing it to be used. They've announced that they're allowing uh, PayPal to use it, for example. So they have a partnership with PayPal to allow fingerprints to enable payment verification for making purchases. Uh, and that's that's a big departure from Apple's philosophy around their fingerprint scanners. So this is this is this is cool. Um, they've also announced uh, that they've uh, they're going to open it up to developers. So they've got APIs there. And the APIs are intended for proof of identity, for fingerprint recognition, uh, for verifying uh, identity. And it's going to be fascinating to see what comes out of that in the next few months. Because now that these APIs, they're called pass APIs, now that, the, now that Samsung's pass APIs and the documentation for them are online, there's going to be all sorts of interesting applications come out of it. You can see how people who have banking applications, perhaps, might want to use uh, the, the pass APIs to verify the identity of people coming into their application. Um, other news uh, on this, speaking of banking and verifying, MasterCard have decided that they're going to use phone location data to, uh, to, to try and help them to avoid um, uh, someone's card being taken and used uh, where the phone isn't, if, if, if that's not an awkward way of putting it. Basically, what they're going to do is they're going to uh, look at someone's purchase location, look at someone's phone location, and if the two are not aligned, they're going to flag it as an issue. So, for example, if I'm in Seville, and someone's using my card, or my phone is in Seville, and someone's using my card in Madrid, then MasterCard will say, oops, that doesn't sound right, and they'll decline the transaction. So it, this, is, this is a good one because most people have their phone with them, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, you know, except you forget it when you go out, um, which is rare enough these days because it's become such, such an, a, a, an important device to have with you. So, like I say, MasterCard are saying, are saying that, that because phones are with people almost all the time, they can use the geolocation in the phone and, you know, put it alongside where someone's purchasing something and use it as a way of detecting fraud. So I think that's an interesting one. Um, it's, it, at the moment, it's in testing. It hasn't been rolled out yet. It's not clear whether it actually will be rolled out, but... I gotta think that, uh, I, that while there are privacy issues there, um, I, th I think I think those will be overcome because those are reasonably trivial. You already give Mastercard your location data anytime you make a purchase. So if it's if it's going to keep your card and your money safe, I think that's something people will be happy enough to sign up to. So one thing here that's interesting is um, I, it wasn't particularly clear to me precisely how they were um, tracking the location. And if they are uh, tracking this, it seems a logical thing to be able to share that with you as a, I mean, if, for example, if I'm getting um, an itemized statement from my month, uh, f f for a month, why can't MasterCard tell me where I'm buying this stuff as well, except only rather than just use it for fraud prevention? I mean, ha having a kind of t having an idea of where my purchase is taking place would be a really useful thing to me to actually do something with from a kind of quantified self point of view. It seems strange to only just have it for this purpose when there are lots of other uses for this. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I you know, you're absolutely right. I suspect, uh, Chris, that they're at the very opening stages of this, mm. and I suspect that you know. If they sit down and think about it for a while, there's a lot of data there that could be very useful, as you say, mm. and maybe they, maybe they would open that up and allow you to, to get it in a, in a soft form that you could actually use it for. Mm. It's, it's, it's a good idea. I, I, I suspect, like I say, they're at the early stages of it, so they probably just haven't thought of it yet. 
what else? Uh, oh yeah, this is a, this is an interesting one, and it's a, it's a local one to me. This is a Spanish company uh, who've come up with this an application called Latch, and they call it a digital padlock. It's a mobile app to allow you to control and monitor access to apps on your phone. Now it it works. Yes, it works in an unusual way. Uh, what you do is you when you have when you have this latch application on your phone, you can go into it and you can say, okay, shut down my Twitter, for example, or shut down my Facebook, or shut down whatever of the applications there are. And what that means is it shuts down login to those applications. So it stops somebody anybody who's, who might want to get into your Twitter, your Facebook, your banking, your whatever applications. So it shuts down the ability for anyone to log in from anywhere, from any device, until you go back to Latch and say, OK, I want to use it now. So now I'm going to open up the ability to log in. So it, it's, it's not that it stops application on one particular device. It stops application, or sorry, it, it stops login from any application, from any site, from anything. So until you go back into the Latch application and say, OK, now I'm going to open this up, and now I can log back into it again, or now it's loggable back into again. So it's, it, it shuts down completely the login to any applications uh, that you have, which is it's an unusual way of doing it, I guess. But it seems interesting, and it seems like uh, it, it's, I'm certainly going to you know, download it and try it out and see how it works. What's not clear to me is what happens if you have other applications which use your application. So for example, on my Twitter account, I have a load of other applications authenticated to use it. I, think what'll ha I, I don't think it'll impact on them. But it's something I need to test before I would deploy this fully. Chris, this is an unusual one. Have you come across this, or have you any um, thoughts on this? I haven't come across this, but this does show, well, I guess a kind of uh, more interesting. Well, if you think about how we're using like, devices and tablets and stuff like that, there's almost, you currently have this kind of binary approach where you either sign into an iPad and then you've got the keys to the entire kingdom or not. And in many cases, that's not necessarily how we, we use some tablets or mobile or some mobile devices. I might want to share things with other people. And you've kind of got this dichotomy here between oh, the really, really biometrics-based approach to something which is a bit more fine-grained. For example, I have a tablet in, in, in my house, and that's something which is shared amongst num a number of people who we, who we tend oh. to use. So, so this would be, uh, for example, I might share it with um, a girlfriend or my, uh, my share that a flatmate be using it. And uh, stuff like this is really, really useful because it gives the... Uh, it, 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 it acknowledges there's more than one user for these kind of devices, which I, I think is interesting to see such stuff like this. The, the concern I have is that I'm not sure what credentials I am I'm, I have to pass on for this to happen, like you're saying. In many cases, uh, if, if you're doing this with banks and things like that, you're often asked to share literally your bank details with, say, a service like a, a no, money dashboard or stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, you, you create another place where uh, another basically point of failure, which is a really, really attractive target. If I was a hacker going after Latch, I know that there's a lot of stuff there now. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a good point. And I, 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 I know they've thought of that, because uh, I, I remember reading in the article that they've dealt with that in some way. But you're right, it is a point of failure. Um, uh, in any of these kind of applications, uh, you know, you're, you're then, while you might trust them with your data and not to mess with it, what if, as you say, hackers break into them? It's the kind of thing that you know uh, has happened lots of times before. You give your data to somebody else, you trust them, but then somebody cracks them, and that that way your data is given away. So it is. It's 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 one of these things you got to weigh it. Maybe start it with something uh, small if you want to try it, and. Uh, don't give it your banking details. <laughs> and then if you're happy with how they're securing it or something, maybe then you know use it for maybe your shopping or something. I don't know. It's, it's, it's one, certainly, I think, that bears a little investigation. Uh, and if you think it's secure enough, it's backed by Telef Telefonica, by the way. Uh, the, the, the company who's developed it are owned by Telefonica. So uh, their, their credentials are pretty good. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe don't give them the keys to the kingdom right off the bat. The next story I came across was, uh, again, from Samsung. 
Uh, this is just a, a quick one. They announced uh, two new uh, chip families, uh, and the reason I, I, I thought this was interesting was because um, the chip families are octa and hexa processors. So an octa processor is an eight-core processor, and a hexa processor is a five-core processor. So they're they're very fast processors, but as well as being very fast processors for the new family of smartphones that Samsung are bringing out, they're also um, using heterogeneous multiprocessing, so they make very efficient use of the cores without draining too much power. And, of course, that has two implications. The first implication is that, A, you know, they don't use much power, which is nice, but the, the, the follow-on implication of that is that they don't drain your battery as fast. And, of course, any smartphone owner knows the thing you're always checking on your smartphone is the battery level. Will it last the full day? Will it last the full day? How long have I got left? Do I need to plug it in? Where is the nearest power outlet? And you know, you go through any number of airports and you're always looking for power outlets. So the while it's great that smartphones are getting more and more powerful, you don't want to do that at the expense of the power drain. And it looks like Samsung and this have done a good job of making highly, highly uh, efficient, fast processors for their new family of phones. Again, more mobile news. Uh, we saw the big news about WhatsApp being bought by Facebook for 19 billion and change. And that's led to a slew of announcements around messaging applications. And one of those uh, is Line, L-I-N-E. And apparently, this Line messaging service, which has been around a while, and I've got an account on it. I've got an account on about 16 or 17 different messaging applications. Uh, the one I've noticed, actually, going off topic for a sec, there's one called Telegram, which is supposed to be quite secure. And uh, I'd signed up for it a few weeks ago. And I've noticed that in the last week, since the WhatsApp announcement, the number of people who joined Telegram was, Telegram was through the roof. So that's always interesting to see. But this one, Line, has decided that they're going to take on Skype and Hangouts with cheap call services. So they, they've announced uh, that you know you can sign up and you get a 30-day plan uh, at 6.5 yen, which is roughly 6.4 US cents. And for that, you get 60 minutes maximum encompassing mobile and landline calls. So it, it's a bit like Skype that way. You can sign up to it and you can get uh, cheap calls uh, Skype is obviously free, Skype to Skype, but you can call out from it to landlines and mobiles and things like that as well. So this is similar to that. Uh, WhatsApp also announced, or uh, WhatsApp also has uh, WhatsApp to WhatsApp calling. Uh, so Line isn't entire, it isn't incredibly um, new to the game with this. It's just there. This is kind of a me too announcement, I think. Google have announced, or they haven't announced, but they've, they've started rolling out quietly uh, photographic backup software for Google Plus users. So if you have Google Plus on your phone and you start taking photographs, which most people do with their smartphones these days, they have an auto backup system. You need to enable it, but if you, if you have it enabled, as soon as you take a photograph, it gets now automatically backed up to a private area on your Google Plus. So it's not shared. It's just a nice handy backup for the or for your photo library on your phone. Um, I've set this already set up using IFTTT. Uh, so anytime I take a photograph, uh, this little thing called IFTTT takes a copy of the photograph and dumps it into box.com. So now my photographs are saved in box.com and on Google Plus. So it's, it's kind of a belt and braces approach. It's quite nice. One thing you do need to be aware of is if you do have services like this turned on, don't have your data roaming turned on while you're in another country, or you could be hit with a heavy bill. Uh, I came across this one. Uh, this, is, this is less mobile. This is more tablet news. And what it is is a founder uh, of EA, uh, which is a big games company. His name is Trip Hawkins, and he's raised six and a half million dollars for a game called If dot dot dot, and it's a tablet game. And If You Can is is the name of the company, and If dot 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 is the name of the iPad game, which they've now launched 
uh, for, for the iPad. I'm not sure if it's available for an Android tablets yet. So it's, it's a game which is specifically aimed at uh, children and teaching children social and emotional skills through play. So if you have kids, this might be an interesting one to check out. This guy Hawkins, he founded Electronic Arts EA in 1982 and then went on to launch the console maker 3DO. So he's got, he's got a lot of experience in this area. And they're using uh, in standards in the uh, what's called the SEL space, the social and emotional learning space. So they brought in people and they, they've, they've researched the standards around this kind of thing and they're aiming to teach children how to manage their moods, interact healthily with peers and face various life challenges. So it seems like a very interesting one, if, as I say, for anyone who has kids to check it out and if they like it, maybe allow their kids to play with it because, I mean, play across all species is the way that we learn. And while a lot of, while there's a lot of um, unease amongst parents around uh, games and the amount of time their children spend playing with games on devices, this one at least is aimed at uh, teaching kids how to learn, uh, how to interact healthily, as opposed to, you know, how to go out and steal cars and kill as many people as possible. Chris, any, any any thoughts on this one? Um, it's um, uh, not 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 much sure that you've already added, added already. Actually, um, it's quite interesting that we've got Moshi Monsters involved, uh, or the, sorry, I mean a few ex Moshi Monsters uh, staff involved on this. Um, yeah. To be honest, you've covered the main things that I probably uh, say myself. So probably could like move on to the next story. Actually, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no worries. Uh, here we go. We got we got to find a way of making this starting the screen share thing a little faster. But anyway. Here we go, on to the next one. So, Internet of Things story. Um, we've covered Internet of Things in, in uh, all of the episodes so far, so we couldn't leave it out of this show. And there was an announcement from Oral-B, who were, you know, the GSK, GlaxoSmithKline owned company that, you know, are a big maker of toothbrushes, and they've got a lot of electric toothbrushes out there. And they've announced this new toothbrush, uh, the 7000 series, which will be able to connect via Bluetooth to your smartphone. And, you know, a bit like the Fitbit Force or the Fitbit One or the Jawbone Up or any of these things, it tracks how you, in this case, clean your teeth. And it tracks, you know, whether you're spending enough time on the left side or the, or the back or the front. or it, So it, it tracks all that. It graphs it for you. It gives you a lot of information on how well or, or otherwise you're cleaning your teeth. But more interestingly, you can share this information with your dentist. And you can have your dentist draw up plans for you on how you should clean your individual teeth and then track how well you're doing against those plans. So it does seem like a very interesting one. The, I've seen a lot of negative response to this online, uh, a lot of people poo-pooing it. And one of the big criticisms of it seems to be around price because it comes in at around $200 US, which is pretty steep for a toothbrush, let's be honest. But I got to say, A, it, it, it seems to be quite a useful device for people who are interested in you know, oral hygiene, which we all should be interested in, of course. But B, I got to think as well, this is the opening round. Any of these things start off high and the price drops over time. So, you know, and Oral-B, as I say, are a big maker of toothbrushes, of electric toothbrushes. So I think they're going to roll this out across all their toothbrushes in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. And at that point, we'll start to see the price come down very, very fast. So one thing that might be worth uh, what I'd really like to find out about is how, how, how much am I locked into using Oral-B from now on when I have this? Because we already have a case where if you buy a razor from Gillette or a, to or a toothbrush from here, um, from Oral-B or any other large company, you, you know, you'll get the initial device fairly cheaply and then you'll basically get taken to the cleaners on the price of every single other, P, you know, all, 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 all the heads and stuff like this. And I feel like this is a really, really good way to lock you into doing something, uh, to, to being stuck using one brand from now on, really. And it highlights, like, well, the, there's almost like a, a need for some kind of a, for some not really regulation yet, but a conversation about making this, this data kind of portable uh, so that you are not tied to one, one single company the whole time. But sure. then again, well... No, you, you, that, that's, a, that's a great point, Chris. You're absolutely right. Um, I, I, 
you know, it, it, it is exactly that. I do have an Oral-B electric toothbrush, um, and I, I, you know, you are stuck with using the heads that they have, um, which surprises me uh, because they shouldn't be that difficult to um, to to create generic copies of. Um, you know, it's it's you, you see generic copies of of you know things like the ink inkjet cartridges, for example, which you'd have to think are more complex than a toothbrush head. Um, maybe people feel there isn't enough money in it because you know the toothbrush heads come in. I gotta say, around five or six euro each. Uh, so maybe it's hard to make ones that are uh, generic and cheaper. But if that's the case, then. Uh, if, if, if you can't make ones cheaper, then they're not really taking you for a ride. I don't know. Well, I guess the thing is interesting. Are you going to see DRM in your toothbrush the <laughs> same way we saw DRM in uh, MP3 players a few years ago? I mean, we've got... It looks like we're going to have a lot of the same things happening again that happened five, six years ago if we don't start having some conversations about this. Or at least there is someone... At least if there isn't someone fighting for the consumer in this, because these are really, really, cool, they're really, really great ideas, but they bring up all these other questions that are not front of mind when, when yeah. uh, building a service like this in the first place, especially when you're coming from, say, Oral-B or a large company in the first place. Yeah, no, it's, 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 you're absolutely right. Yeah, the, the proprietary issue is, is one that is uh, worrisome if you can't kind of uh, source your devices somewhere else, then it's, it, it, it is something to be concerned about. Uh, it, it's exactly the same with razors, as you say. You, you, you buy you know, your, your razor, and then you're locked into buying the heads for that razor from the same company for the next however long. It's, uh, it's the old, it was, wasn't it Gillette who came up with that model first? It's, mm. Yeah, the old razor model. It's, yeah, yeah. It, it seems to be stuck to bathrooms for some reason. Razors, <laughs> toothbrushes. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. <laughs> okay, moving on. So uh, the next uh, story I came across was an interesting one. I mentioned it last week. It's in the electric vehicle space, and it's how Tesla have announced this gigafactory uh, where they're going to be building um, massive amounts of batteries for their electric vehicles. Um, and basically, the output from the factory, from their one single large factory, they reckon uh, will equal the entire world's output in 2013. So the entire world's output of lithium batteries in 2013 is what they'll be putting out from this one factory that they're going to be building. And uh, you know, wh while that's interesting in and of itself, the, the real interesting part of this is that they're not just going to be building batteries for their own cars, but they'll also be building batteries to sell, apparently, on the consumer market. And why, why is that interesting? I mean, who wants to buy a large battery pack? Well, it becomes very interesting for people who have solar, ba or solar panels. And Tesla has already been running trials with a company called Solar City, which is run by Elon Musk's cousin Lyndon Rive, on a storage unit. So what what this, this how this starts to get interesting is people who have solar panels on the roof, they're taking in energy, you know, in the middle of the day. That's when you know you're taking in the maximum amount of energy. But that's not when the maximum demand is. The maximum demand is later in the day when people come home from work, when the sun has started to dip in the sky. What if, though, you could take in the energy at the time it's producing maximally, store it in a big battery in your house somewhere, and then, when you come home from work, start using that to cook your dinner or whatever? Because at that time, that's when everyone is coming home from work, Everyone is putting on their cooker, or if it's cold, putting on their heaters, or turning on their TVs, their big ass plasma displays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, so the, the the demand on the system starts to ramp up at that time when the sun is going down, so the production isn't ramping up. So maybe at that time, the price is going up on the market. So maybe you want to start selling your excess energy into the market at that time, as opposed to earlier in the day when there's less demand and the price is lower. Also, you can use it, if you've, if you've taken it in and stored it, you can use it to charge your electric vehicle if you have one. You know, so it starts to get really interesting. Um, this is a really good article. 
uh, and it's, it's on the Forbes site, and the link will be in the notes. It's, it's a really interesting article because they're positing all kinds of interesting ideas like that, and they're talking about how the utilities companies often, particularly in Arizona, where they're very hostile to solar, ironically, um, the, the utilities are. Uh, it, it, so they're, they're, they're positing that, well, you know, in that case, if the utility companies are going to be hostile to, so, to solar, you know, there's a very large chance that utilities customers might just say, well, sod you. I'm going to buy this big-ass battery, charge it from the sun in Arizona, there's plenty of it, and just stay off-grid completely. So it, it's, it's, it's good because it's putting power back in the hands of consumers, potentially. So one thing that's interesting about um, the lithium story here um, is probably some of the geopolitics involved in it. I mean, if a single company is basically doubling the output of this stuff, and uh, when you look at um, that more than half, well, I think about half of all the, um, the uh, lithium uh, that used to evacuate is mined from a single country, Bolivia, you've got, you, you've got some this, there's some interesting geopolitics associated with this, actually. And it would be, it would be, it would be, I'm, I'm curious to see how relations between uh, Bolivia and the and the US would, would evolve over time when you sit with in, over the next say twelve months or so in light of well such pivotal you know such huge yeah. investments in uh, from, from 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 a single American company. True, true. Although I did see, and I can't remember where now, but I, I did see last year that there was a significant find of lithium somewhere else. I. Th I think it was in the US, but I'm not 100%. But I know there was a large, a large find of lithium somewhere else. So Bolivia now won't be the only country uh, supplying. It, it's not the only country. It's the only significant country supplying lithium. There are stores of lithium in China and, and other countries as well. Um, I think Turkey has some as well, for example. And there's a few more. But Bolivia has the main store, you're right, or did until this other find. So, but you're right, it, it does have. Uh, huge implications for uh, for all kinds of issues when you know one factory is outputting what was the global output up until this year. So, it, but you know, you, you've got the geopolitical issues, but then you've got the consumer empowerment issues, which is mm. really good. <laughs> so next up, and I came across this story. Uh, it's kind of a robotics story, and you know, when I was uh, heading over to Las Vegas. Uh, they showed the movie on the plane, they showed the movie Captain Phillips, and that was a story uh, w with Tom Hanks playing the lead role about him being the captain of the container ship which is taken by pirates, uh, and it's, it's based on a true story, uh, taken by pirates off the coast of Somalia. Somalia, Somalia. And so it, I, I had that in mind when I read this story, and this is a story about Rolls-Royce developing drone ships, so, you know, pilotless ships. Uh, for the for the freight industry for big shipping companies, uh, so you know the likes of Maersk and etc would be able to buy these ships which wouldn't require a crew, and they could be um, driven, for want of a better word, uh, remotely from a control room by you know pilots who had a 360 degree view and all the instrumentation because these ships are heavily instrumented. We know that, uh, so it would be an interesting way of a avoiding costs, uh, b uh, Reducing the pollution and the uh, making the ships more efficient because these are more up-to-date uh, designs, uh, and also um, removing a lot of risk for the uh, the crews of these 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 container ships because if there's no crew on the ship, then it's a lot less interesting to pirates because the pirates make their money on the hostages they take as opposed to the cargo itself. So it's it's an interesting one. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, backwards and forwards in the article. It's a Bloomberg article. There's a lot of backwards and forwards in the article about whether these will ever happen. And of course, uh, they, they talk about the safety standards and the cost of crews per day, uh, these kind of things. And and when they start talking to the unions, of course, the, the unions are kind of up in arms saying, no, 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 this will never happen. Uh, but then they start, and you can see there's a, a link here, or there's a, there's a bit here about the union opposition. And they talk about as well the fact that redundant redundant systems that like you have on planes would need to be built in, but you know you gotta think that they should be built in anyway whether you have a crew or not. Um, so it's 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 uh, th th there's a there's a couple of people who in this article say no this will never ever happen, and I, I, they they come you have to think from kind of a vested background. Um, I think this is the future. I do. I, I, I think this is going to happen. 
Um, I, I think it's going to happen for a number of reasons. Uh, it'll cut down on crew costs, and that'll be the main reason it'll happen. Um, we're seeing uh, more and more uh, this kind of thing being rolled out. Uh, they, they talk about safety as well in the article, and the fact that almost all maritime accidents are caused by human error. But that's the same with the, the airline industry as well. It's, you know, I, I, I heard a guy say in the US not so long ago that very soon uh, planes will be flown uh, by a, a captain and a dog. And the captain will be in the, in the uh, cockpit to keep the people in the back of the plane happy that there's a human operating the plane. And the dog will be there to make sure that the captain doesn't touch any of the controls. <laughs> so it's, 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 kind of a, it's kind of a facetious comment. Uh, but it's, uh, when, when, when planes and ships and cars as well, because we're seeing driverless cars being trialed as well, and eventually we'll get there, because there's, there's so many safety issues involved, and there's so many cars on the road, there's so many planes in the air, there's so many ships in the sea, it really gets to a point where it's very hard to manage all those things at a human level, and you know, computer systems are far better able to cope with the kind of things that can come up in these kind of situations. Chris, what do you what do you think about that? Uh, this one's really really interesting for the reasons that we were talking about um, SCADA systems and things before. So yeah. um, I mean, it's not. Uh, I'll share a link with you from a while, from a while ago, which is the first thing I thought thought of when I saw this. Um, so we a lot of the same issues about uh, SCADA apply to any kind of large uh, thing like this. So um, for example, Boeing seven four sevens they technically count as a you know they 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 they, they technically as, as a Unix machine. And uh, you know, as a giant flying SCADA system. So, in the same way that if you got load of, um, if you start thinking of drones, or, you know, the, a, basically a drone ship as a low, all, all these freighters just loads and loads of SCADA systems full of oil or full full of goods zipping around uh, oceans. Then, well, it sounds like uh, the makings of some crazy science fiction disaster <laughs> movie at times. I mean, it's really really fascinating. But one thing that would be really, uh, well, you know, what I'm interested in finding out about is how people end up protecting this stuff because uh, yeah there is some t there are people are touching on the subject of hackers and stuff like that on here but yeah it's um as soon as you remove people from this then you uh, then, then it's very well, you, you end up with, with with stuff like this and uh, well, sure I, I think though uh, referencing going back to the article earlier about the uh, utility companies and the SCADA as you, as you mentioned but the this I think was Kiln Systems was the name of the insurance company uh, they also uh, as well as utilities or very few utilities because most of them aren't up to grade they also insure container ships mm. and uh, uh, they seem pretty thorough because they have a lot to lose yeah. <laughs> they seem pretty thorough in, 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 in how they, they think about insuring uh, these large devices, be they, you know, container ships or uh, utility companies, they're turning down the utility companies because they're not secure. I think they would be very rigorous about whether or not to insure these container ships if they're driverless. Mm. And what would be interesting? Oh, sorry, I'm just lost, losing you there. I'm curious about how Rolls Royce would actually charge. What the pricing model for this would be? Because uh, Rolls Royce, they charge. They don't sell. They don't sell jet engines for people. They they charge. By the hour of jet usage uh, for 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 various aircraft, so they'll have a they'll have ground crew at every single airport, and then they you basically pay a service so that you 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 pay for the jet use of the jet engine by the hour rather than paying for a piece of metal in its own right. So you might see well really interesting pricing models come as a result of this. So well we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. It's still early days, but hey. it is yeah it is. So uh, you said you were losing me. You're still able to see me. Uh, yeah, I can see you now. Yeah, there was there was a bit of sync. Uh, you're a little bit out of sync just then, but it's 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 good again now. Though. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, so there was an interesting. Uh, we're back on Arizona again for some reason. Uh, uh, Arizona, the the legislature, the Senate there passed an anti-gay bill uh, during the week, uh, where they said you know for religious reasons. Uh, Retail outlets, shops, restaurants, all these kind of things could refuse service to gay people if they felt it was against their own, you know, religion. And that raised a lot of people's backs. And I know this is, you know, particularly in, 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 uh, a technology story, uh, or at least that part of it isn't. But where it gets interesting is Apple have plans to build a massive 
facility in Arizona to, um, to, to, to make their sapphire displays for their new phones. And Apple just stood up straight away and said, nope, <laughs> you, you, uh, you pass this law and we'll move our big plant somewhere else. And then it turns out Apple aren't alone in it. It wasn't just Apple, but lots of other companies got up and put, um, put pressure on the governor, whose name is Jan Brewer, and I have a list of them highlighted in this second article from The Guardian. And it was Apple, American Airlines, Marriott, and Delta Airlines uh, opposed to the bill. Uh, Sports Illustrated reports that the NFL had started to investigate the possibility of moving the next Super Bowl away from Arizona, and Major League Baseball issued a statement condemning the legislation. Prominent Republicans also argued for a veto, Republicans that is, including Arizona Senators John McCain and Jeff Flake and former presidential candidate Mitt Romney. So Jan Brewer, who is the governor, who is a Republican as well, vetoed the bill so it's not going to happen. So. Fantastic to see the, the tech companies there, you know, weighing in and leveraging their uh, their, their their particular uh, uh, influence uh, and, and and going in the right direction with it. Um, you know, it, it's always a bit worrisome when you see companies um, um, uh, using their their leverage on politicians, uh, particularly when the fossil fuel companies are doing it. But in this case, <laughs> they they did it for the right reasons, and we got a good outcome. Uh, there was a story in uh, The Verge this week which uh, I thought was a little unsettling and it was around Chicago and we've, we've, we've got you know three stories left this is the third last story so we're coming up on the hour I'm aware of that uh, th this one is around a, a computer system in Chicago which helps the police predict crimes and they start off the story when they talk about the Chicago PD turning up on the door of a guy called Robert McDaniel last summer. He's a 22-year-old high school dropout. He answered the door to the police, and the police said, we know you haven't committed any crime yet, but you've got to be aware you've come up in our system as someone who's likely to commit crime. Be aware we're watching you. <laughs> and you kind of, so the, the, the computer system they have generates what they call a heat list. It's an index of about 400 people in the city of Chicago who are most likely to be involved in violent crime. It, it, it sounds completely unbelievable, except it's, it, it's true. This is actually true. They're actually doing this. They're using predictive analytics to predict who's going to do the next crime. They're dropping in on them and they're saying, be careful. We're watching you. Don't step out of line. <laughs> I, I couldn't find in the article any... Uh, any listing or, or, or any data around when they roll this out and how much crime has dropped in the meantime, or if it has dropped, or if it's had any effect. But you know, you, and even the article itself is headlined "The Minority Report: Colon Chicago's New Police." You know, it's 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 okay. I don't know. It it seems you know we're heading into science fiction world when this kind of thing is being rolled out. It's it's really really scary. Two last stories um, and two good news stories to, to finish up on. Uh, this one from the BBC uh, talking about how a new online tool tracks tree loss, so forestation or deforestation, in near real time. It's uh, it, from the Global Forest Watch. It's backed by Google and over 40 business and campaigning groups. So companies uh, like Nestle, for example, who have been trashed before for using unsustainably sourced uh, palm oil, can now use this to show where they're getting their supplies from, and they can say, nope, our stuff is being sourced sustainably. So Nestle are involved in this. As I say, Google is involved in this, and the Global Forest Watch and several other organizations. It, it takes... Uh, monthly monthly satellite images, and so they can see month on month whether deforestation is occurring in a particular area. And finally, the last story: uh, Facebook-led Internet Org is partnering with Nokia on a thing called Social Edu in Rwanda, Unilever in India, and Ericsson on new labs to connect developing economics. It's a long story. It's worth a read. It's great to see how these companies. I know. You look at Facebook, and they're trying to get the next billion people on in developing countries. But as I say, and you you might look at that cynically, and you know, 
it, there is a kind of a, a jaundice approach you could have, you know, you could take on that. But, and this is, the, the, there's a study from Deloitte which, you know, full disclosure, it was commissioned by Facebook, but it did so that improved internet access in developing economies can increase productivity by up to 25% and generate $2.2 .2 trillion more in GDP and 150 million new jobs. Take those numbers with a, you know, as I say, it was commissioned by Facebook, so take those numbers with a bucket of salt. But so many stories you hear about the developing world and how they how how access to the internet in those countries is increasing productivity, whether it's by twenty five percent or not, I don't know. But it does increase productivity. It does generate more GDP, and it does generate new jobs for people who might never have had jobs before. So. Anything that, that works to increase internet access in these developing countries has got to be a good thing. So that's the last uh, story I have from the show today. Um, Chris, we're going to wrap up. Yes. Uh, any, any final comments from yourself? Um, one thing was the story about, uh, you mentioned on The Verge, the Minority Report, uh, Minority Report-esque uh, story of basically, you know, people turning up uh, t t turning up at your door. Um, one of the things that's quite chilling about this is um, the algorithms, when, when someone does do that, I mean, what recourse do you actually have to challenge an algorithm or challenge anything from there? I mean, I don't, I don't know how I would, let's say someone is turning up, how can I challenge that? Uh, there, there's an assumption that uh, you, you have something of, of an opaque algorithm or that, that you're not really, this isn't being shared how these are uh, how people decide whether you're the person they should be at the door at the end. I imagine we'll probably see some kind of court case soon about about this stuff here. It, it, it's true. It's true. Um, I, I'm not sure what the law is like in, in the US mm. on this kind of thing. I suspect, I suspect you'd have a hard time uh, taking a court case against police saying we're keeping an eye on you. Uh, mm. if, if they haven't taken you downtown, haven't arrested you, mm. uh, you know, haven't thrown you in jail, uh, and you haven't done anything, if they just come along and say, be careful, we're keeping our eye on you, <sighs> unless you can prove there's been breaches of your privacy, I, I, I think that's going to be hard to do anything about. Well, it seems to be attacking the symptom rather than, uh, it seems to be attacking the problem at the wrong stage. Like, if you are able to uh, recognize and see patterns here, then why would you not be in getting other people involved who can fi help find ways out of that? Or why, why would you not be using that to direct funding, uh, you know, investing in a community rather to, uh, you know, address issues of poverty and stuff rather absolutely. than just uh, absolutely people in jail? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, there is there are so many things that could be done to help with education, help help with poverty, all these kind of things that absolutely should be doing. In investing in this, not so sure it's a great idea, as you say. Okay. okay. On that note, uh, we've gone two minutes over the hour. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for, for joining me today. It's, 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 it added, it's added a great dynamic to the show, I think. All right, cool. Lo lovely to be here, Tom. Thank you. All right. And uh, we'll be on again next week. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to join me, Chris, but if not, we'll, we'll have someone else on. And uh, we'll have a show again, Episode 7, next week. Same time, same bat channel. Cheers, everyone. Excellent. ta -ra. See ya.